Okay. You still got it, right? Yes. Okay. Okay. Hi, everyone. So um, thank you for having me today. So thank you for the introduction, Lee. Um, just to kind of um, fill you guys in, um, I, I developed an interest in this topic when in 2014, I decided it was a good idea while working full time to go back to school to get a doctoral degree. So um, <clears throat> you might question my judgment there, but that was a, a tough <laughs> couple of years. But at any rate, in my doctor of physical therapy program, um, they taught us a lot of things that we really didn't get in my bachelor of physical therapy program, which I graduated from in 1994. Um, and one of the things that they really talked about um, was taking care of patients in a way that wasn't just fixing them. Um, a lot of physical therapy involves, oh, I've had this injury or I have this illness and now I can't do these things. And so I need to be fixed. I need that impairment fixed. Um, I learned that there's a lot more. There should be a lot more to physical therapy um, and that it involves more wellness than just that. So that's kind of why, if you're wondering, you know, where did this topic come from? So I developed an interest and I've, I've stayed up on that ever since. Um, I do participate as needed in Altman's survivorship program. Um, just meeting with uh, patients one-on-one -on -one after their treatment to kind of help them get back on track from a physical wellness perspective. Um, <clears throat> so that's why I'm talking about this topic. It is um, pretty near and dear to me. It's something I, I try to stay up on. And I'll tell you that this presentation uh, has a couple different iterations. And this one um, has more of a healthcare provider audience. So um, a lot of the scientific stuff that you'll see on the screen, I'll probably just sort of skip over or summarize that. So um, don't let that distract you by saying nurse participant, because it's anybody who's participating um, can benefit from this. But our objectives are really to talk about what is cancer survivorship um, and what is the role of exercise in dealing with issues that people may have after a, a cancer treatment. Um, and I'll make specific recommendations about exercise interventions that can help people who've gone through cancer manage cancer-related fatigue and improve their quality of life. And I'll also identify some local community resources that um, cancer survivors can use to make sure that they're living their best life after they have gone through treatment. So uh, the old way of thinking, even, you know, when I entered the healthcare environment was that, boy, cancer, you know, you've got cancer, we really don't have much power over it. Um, it's in control, it's sort of defining um, how that patient's, how the rest of their life will play out. That's the way we kind of used to think about cancer. It was, you know, it's still a dreaded word, but certainly we have a lot more um, control now than we ever did in the past. So that's kind of an old way to think about it. Um, we also focused in healthcare, and we still are suffering from this today, where we focus on treatment of disease and not um, being well. So um, that is something that that not just cancer related, we need to deal with in every front, but certainly on the cancer forefront. We can't just treat the disease of cancer and then say, okay, you're done. I mean, we have to kind of have some, some guidance for the rest of your life. So really thinking about just treating the disease is, in my view, old thinking. Um, and another thing that we sort of used to think about when we would think about cancer patients is, oh, they can't exercise. My gosh, they're way too tired. You know, we've done these treatments on them that not only are killing the cancer cells, it's killing the rest of our cells. And, and the body has been ravaged both by the disease and the treatments. Um, and so we just, you know, we expect them to be tired. And that's just the way it's going to be. So that's kind of old thinking. But really, um, looking at more current research, we find that really that's, that's not the way it is. Um, so the first stat I have on here is really super encouraging. So this study looked at um, what survival rates were. Um, breast cancer was pointed out in this study. So if you look at how far we have come, um, in 1960, if you were diagnosed with breast cancer, your survival rate was 63%. 
in 2010, and think about that's 12 years ago. So I'm wondering if that's not better now, uh, but our survival rate jumped to 90%. Um, and, and the authors of this study said, well, okay, so more people are surviving these cancer diagnoses because we're finding it earlier. Um, we're getting effective treatments to them earlier. So more people are surviving. Um, the American Cancer Society 2020 statistic, 67% of patients diagnosed with cancer are going to live another at least five years. Um, so, you know, I'm sure that that is much improved also from, um, you know, way back when. So what does that all mean? It means that healthcare providers um, and patients really need to start to focus on interventions that's going to improve their quality of life because, you know, chances are they're going to they're going to get through this and they're going to have many years to come and we want them to have a good quality of life. So what does survivorship mean? Um, you might hear me say that word a lot. Um, it's basically any, it's the minute somebody is diagnosed with cancer and includes the whole rest of their life. And it's not just that person's physical life. Survivorship is about their life experience. It's about their patient social support system. So, um, you know, anytime we talk about survivorship, it's really kind of a holistic look at where do I go from here? Okay, I got through this cancer, I did my treatment, now what? You know, how do I, how do I get back into life? Um, so that's the, what we're looking at here is people who've, you know, already been diagnosed with cancer, already been treated and, and where they go from there. Um, so we know that survivorship should be very long-term. I've mentioned that even after the cancer treatment is over, it should envelop their social structure. So friends or family that they have involved in their care um, can benefit from education that we can provide as well as the patient. Um, and really, uh, if we've got, you know, uh, physical defects, self-care defects, communication or eating defects, really survivorship should include rehabilitation services. Um, and, and all that's from the Brana study in 2010. Um, so when we're talking about exercise during the survivorship periods, the minute of diagnosis to the end of life, um, we're talking about um, exercise being a secondary and tertiary prevention mechanism. So what does that mean? Because that sounds pretty um, health carry. <laughs> so basically primary prevention is those things that we do to keep us from getting a disease. So in the cancer population, that's not what exercise does. Obviously they've already got the cancer. Now it could be a primary preventative to avoid the patient getting heart disease or something after their cancer diagnosis. Um, but for the most part, that's not why we're, you know, doing exercise for these patients. It's certainly not going to stop them from getting cancer. Now, keep in mind, if you are, sitting here today cancer-free, we do know that exercise is associated with a reduced risk of cancer. So exercise is important. Um, it doesn't 100% um, take away the risk of cancer, but it certainly puts the odds more in our favor. So we're gonna be focusing today on secondary and tertiary prevention. So a person's already got cancer. We can't stop them from getting cancer through having exercise, um, but we're going to prescribe treatments and behaviors that are either gonna slow their disease down um, or decrease the impact of the disease so that they don't have as much disability and they have the highest quality of life. So that's, that's kind of what we're talking about today. Um, Cancer-related fatigue is um, probably the most distressing um, sequela of cancer that, that I've heard about in my career. You know, it's people who have had cancer will tell you that it's an unbelievable level of fatigue. It's overwhelming. It lasts for a super long time after treatment. It comes on very suddenly a lot of times. And I think this is, again, related to that whole, um, your body's been ravaged by the disease and ravaged in some cases by the treatment. I know we're getting better at focal treatment of the cancer, but a lot of times you've just got really systemic effects that are resulting in this fatigue. And, you know, that fatigue really can lead people down the rabbit hole of thinking wrong because it is so, it is such a big symptom. It's, it's so overwhelming. So you're, if it's you with cancer, family member with cancer or acquaintance with cancer, they might be thinking, oh my gosh, I'm so tired. I just need to rest. And so they think if they rest, they'll get more energy. 
Unfortunately, in cancer-related fatigue, that is not correct. Um, it'll actually get worse. Uh, we know it's natural for people to do this, to, to rest. They feel like I'm tired, I need to rest. We know that at least a third of cancer patients decrease their activity level once they're diagnosed. That could have a depression as a source, it could have fatigue as a source, um, but for whatever reason, it's sort of volitionally reduced um, after their cancer diagnosis comes. And much like the general population, 70% of cancer patients don't get the recommended amount of exercise. And we will talk about what that recommended amount of exercise is to give you a better idea. Um, but I mentioned that you know, uh, avoiding exercise is the wrong thing to do because it actually causes a downward spiral where the deconditioning just gets worse and worse and worse. Um, and we know from um, patient surveys that really, you know, when they we talk to patients about their cancer-related fatigue, they say, I, I need help. I'm not sure how to move. I'm not sure how to exercise. Um, I'm sure it, it must feel unsafe. Um, when your body's that tired, your brain's telling you you need to rest. Um, it's probably pretty scary to say, oh, just, you know, buck up and get on the exercise bike. They want, they want some guidance. So um, I'm just going to kind of outline some of that today. Now, before we get into the specific parameters of exercise on the next slide, um, I just want to talk through this because you might be thinking, well, is there a pill for that? Um, the answer is there's a pill for that, but it's not very effective. Um, so Doctors sometimes will treat cancer-related fatigue with stimulants and antidepressants. Um, this study, Mustian et al. from 2017, was, you know, it's a meta-analysis, so it takes a bunch of, um, of good, good research subject, you know, uh, research projects, puts them all together, and, you know, comes up with a bigger pile of data or proof on what works and what doesn't. And basically what this study did is it compared exercise and counseling in a group of cancer patients with cancer-related fatigue to a group of patients who got stimulants and antidepressants um, for their cancer-related fatigue. And what they found was um, the exercise and, and counseling group got significantly better than those that tried the medication options. So their conclusion from this meta-analysis was exercise and counseling really should be a first-line treatment for cancer-related fatigue. And that's um, why I've done this presentation for um, our oncological nurses, um, just to kind of you know, get that message out there. So this is a very busy slide. So we're going to try to... Um, to, to distill this down. And I actually probably should have put it backwards. So I'm gonna go ahead and forward to one more slide. We're gonna look at the global view and then we'll go back to the um, detail. So this slide is taken from the Department of Health and Human Services. So this is um, a report and a recommendation that they put out. They update it every few years, um, but it really is a guidebook for how much exercise do adults need? Um, to stay healthy. That's really what it is. So they call it move your way and they've got it about as simple as it can possibly get here. And I should say that this guide is for well people and it also includes people who maybe aren't well. So people with cancer, um, people that have, you know, some level of disease, diabetes, whatever. Um, it, it's really the same recommendation for everybody with a little bit of tweaking. So first thing in your brain, you just kind of want to get this. It's a two-pronged recommendation. So first of all, the very first thing that's recommended, cancer patients and everybody, is there should be 150 minutes of moderate intensity aerobic activity per week. So what does that mean? Anything that raises your heart rate, makes you breathe a little bit faster is aerobic. Um, 150 minutes a week is cumulative. You might remember in iterations of this report over the decades, they used to say, oh, it needs to be three times a week. And then they'd say, oh, it needs to be most days of the week, which is at least four, right? They're, they're kind of getting away from that. And they're saying, let's just look at the dose of minutes that we have to do of aerobic exercise to be effective. That magic number is 150. It does not matter. If you get that 150 minutes, 60 minutes at a time, 30 minutes at a time, 10 minutes at a time, or five minutes at a time, does not matter. 
um, the, the total is what's important. So you'll notice what I've circled at the bottom, I think is super relevant to the cancer fatigue patient who may be thinking about that 150 minutes and going, oh my God, there's no way I get tired walking to the bathroom. Um, this says, if you can't do the 150, it's okay, because even five minutes of it shows health benefits in the research, period. So um, you got to move some. So if your first week as a cancer patient, you try aerobic activity and you can only get five minute bouts in, um, that's better than not moving at all. And if you're total for the week, if you do that every day for seven days, so you're starting at 35 minutes, the next week, maybe you try 40 minutes. You know, it, it, it's, it, you just really need to start where you are. Um, and that's, this guide talks about that. Start low and go slow if you're needed, if it's needed. So that's the first prong is the moderate intensity aerobic activity. And we'll talk about how you know it's moderate or not um, here in a moment when we get more detail. The second prong of regular exercise that everybody needs, including cancer patients, is muscle strengthening activity two days a week. Okay, um, so we'll talk a little bit more about that. But think about it, exercise, aerobic activity, and um, strengthening. So we're going to go back to the slide with a little bit more detail. <coughs> um, so we talked about moderate intensity aerobic exercise. And if you see the blue box in the middle, this is an easy way to, to decide if something is moderate intensity. Um, you could use RPE scales or anything you wanted to use. You could measure your um, heart rate if you wanted to, but this is the easy way. You'll know that you're working at a moderate intensity level if you can talk while you're doing the activity. So let's say you're walking with a friend at the park if you can carry on a conversation with them, you know, your heart rate's up, your breathing's up, but you can talk, then you're working at a moderate intensity level. If you can only say a few words while without having to take a breath, then you're probably working too hard. Um, it's not saying for a healthy person that a vigorous intens intensity level is bad. It's just saying you don't need to go that high. So for somebody that's recovering from cancer treatment, um, you know, you, you want to stay in that moderate range. Now, um, if you can sing while you're walking, you're, you're probably not working hard enough. It's probably a little bit too low. So that's kind of that blue box in the center. So keep that in, in mind. That's sort of how you know if something is moderate intensity or not. Now, I like to recommend low impact for cancer survivors. And the reason I do that is because they could have bone weakening from a number of different treatments. So walking is good, Family walks are even better. Um, there's actually been research on that because that sort of helps with the mental side and the social side as well. Um, so if you can walk with a group, friends, family, that's fantastic. Now, where here we come up on winter, you might not be able to do that all the time. Um, swimming is good um, because it's not going to put extra pressure on those bones. And stationary cycling is good because then you don't have the risk of um, accidents. So the other, other items that might be helpful for you, I like ellipticals a lot. Um, they are lower impact, they are weight bearing, but which, you know, some degree of weight bearing is important for people, but um, there's not that pounding. Um, treadmills are okay with walking, you gotta watch. Um, they can be dangerous though with the belt moving. Um, so sometimes I don't recommend treadmills for that reason. Um, so again, this kind of has that total of 150 minutes a week. So if people say, well, how should I break it up? You know, they can break it up into seven days if they want. I know a lot of people do like two to four um, times a week, you know, so you can give um, people that goal um, if you if you want to. Um, they did find too, I just threw another stat in here because um, they, they looked at some colon cancer patients in this study, and it was McMillan, I believe, that looked at this one. Um, but they found that there is a dose response effect. And basically what that means is when you do aerobic activity, um, if you're getting you know, 40 minutes of exercise in a week, 40 minutes of aerobic exercise in a week at moderate intensity um, one week, and then you get 60 minutes the next week, they're finding um, that every time you, you sort of bump that up 
um, it, you're getting a dose response effect. So you're getting better health effects every time you get a little bit more exercise in. Um, so definitely keep that in mind. Um, so that's the aerobic exercise picture. Um, again, I think the key things to remember, if you can talk but not sing, you're probably um, working at a good moderate intensity level for yourself. Um, you know, if you can't even carry on a conversation, you're probably working too hard, okay? Shooting for 150 minutes total in seven days. Now let's shift over and talk about specifics of weight training. At the bottom of the slide, you might be, oh my gosh, what is all that number? So, so basically, um, this is this tells you a target of how much weight to lift, okay? So basically what you wanna do is you wanna know what your one repetition maximum is. So let's just use a bicep curl as an example. If I go to my YMCA and I pick up a 20 pound dumbbell and I can do one bicep curl, but oh my God, I try to do the second one and I can't do it. Then 20 pounds is my one repetition maximum because it's the most weight I can do a full repetition on. OK, so in order to challenge our muscles enough, we want to try to weight train at 60 to 70 percent of that number. OK, um, so what I would choose in this example, I had a 20 pound bicep curl. I could only do that once. 60 to 70 percent of that is about a 12 to 14 pound weight. So I'm going to start with a 12 pound weight and I'm going to do bicep curls and I'm going to try to do at least eight of them. And then I'm going to rest for a significant amount of time. And then I'm going to do another set of eight. Okay. So that's, that's kind of how you dose your exercise there. Um, pardon me for one moment. I just need to give a quick reply to this. Okay. Um, now, I will tell you, if you go to a YMCA, you go to a facility like that, I much prefer weight machines for people, especially if they're not super experienced on uh, weight training. Um, my finding is if, if you're using a weight machine and you're, you're looking at the little sticker on it that tells you how to line up and how to do the exercise, that machine is gonna control your arc of motion and it's going to reduce the likelihood that you're going to hurt yourself because, you know, I see um, when I go to my YMCA, I see all kinds of craziness and with people with free weights, I see them doing all kinds of goofy compensations and arcs of motion. And I think, oh my gosh, they're going to hurt themselves. So um, if you aren't experienced at weightlifting, my recommendation is to try weight machines because they're just going to keep you that much safer. All right, so we already talked about that. Um, now, I wanted to talk about another special population because I think um, if you start out prior to cancer and you're obese and you're physically inactive, so you're a metabolic syn syndrome type patient, um, you might be thinking, uh, you know, I've, first of all, I have a hard enough time exercising. Um, before I knew I had cancer, you know, I'm big, it hurts to move. I don't have much endurance. Now I've had cancer. It can be, it can seem very monumental, but I'm going to tell you that in this, um, in this population, there was a study done on patients who prior to their breast cancer had baseline metabolic syndrome. So they were obese, they were physically inactive. Um, what happened when we had a group that um, got aerobic and resistance training activity to their level of ability three times a week for 16 weeks? What happened with those people? Um, what we saw in that group of people in that study is even greater improvements in their quality of life, in their cancer-related fatigue level, and in their depression. So even people who were starting out, quote, in the hole because they were already, um, you know, out of shape, even after their cancer, even after they went through all of that, we give them exercise, what they can do three times a week for 16 weeks, we saw marked improvement, um, way bigger than um, other studies. So we know that this is really, really super helpful for those people who are starting out um, with a metabolic syndrome. Um, in addition to those patient self-reported things, you know, it's hard to measure quality of life, depression, and fatigue. Those are kind of only the patient knows um, how severe that is. In addition to that, we found some scientifically measurable um, benefits for these people. So 
uh, we found increases in their VO2 max, which is how much oxygen their body can process um, in their muscle strength and, and a decrease in their resting heart rate. So literally there was no downside. I mean, zero for these people. It was only to get better. So even for people with challenges, um, you know, this exercise after cancer is clearly beneficial, clearly. Um, so if you're a cancer survivor, where can you find help with exercise? Because we saw on the one slide where patients say, hey, I really need somebody to advise me. So I'm going to recommend a couple things. Number one, um, a personal trainer who has an American Council of Sports Medicine or American something sports medicine, I can't think what the C is right now, um, but they are ACSM certified in personal training. Those types of personal trainers receive extensive education and training. This is not a weekend personal trainer course online. It's not a quickie thing. And it includes exercise in special populations including heart disease, including cancer, including, um, you know, elderly, different age groups. It's, it's a very, very um, rigorous certification. So if you're going to go the personal trainer route, ask about their certification and see if they do have a certification that deals with special populations like cancer, because it's not, you know, um, the, it, it's not really the use it or lose it, go hard, it's got to hurt to get better. You know, we've already talked about that. So you want somebody who understands that. Um, the other thing that you can do is go to a physical therapist like me. Um, so your insurance might require a referral, might not. We don't require a referral here. Sometimes insurances do. Um, but this route can be especially helpful if you're a patient who has other musculoskeletal conditions that in the past have stopped you from exercise, like, you know, oh, I've had this chronic back pain. And, um, you know, if you just go out there post cancer and you say, you know what, I'm going to beat this, I'm going to hop on this treadmill and I'm going to walk, you know, 30 minutes and you do that and it flares up your spinal stenosis, guess what? <laughs> you're probably not going to do it again. So a physical therapist can help you if you've got other conditions like that. We can help you modify your exercise so that it does not cause you those problems. Um, and then there are also some community programs. So Altman's Moving Forward program, um, that's the one that I do. Um, counseling when people need it. I do 20-minute sessions that are individualized with people um, if they need advice on, on um, any physical issues that they're having post-cancer treatment. Um, I just looked this up this morning to make sure it was still there because, you know, COVID killed so many good things. I wanted to make sure it was still there. But at the North Canton YMCA, they do have a Live Strong. I thought it was called Living Strong, Living Well. It looks like it might just be called Live Strong now. And I believe it's the... Um, bicyclist, Lance Armstrong's program. But, uh, you know, as you know, he had cancer and um, that's a program that they have designed. I want to say it's free, but uh, don't quote me on that. It might be grant funded, um, but that is a um, exercise program. I believe it's somewhat of a group exercise program, but there is a, um, a gal there that's trained specifically to work with cancer patients on how to exercise. So that's a great resource for you. Um, the American Cancer Society, their website um, talks a lot about exercise in survivorship and they have very specific parameters. Um, I have compared those with what I've presented today and they are consistent, um, but that's something that you can continue to refer back to. Um, now, if anybody on the call has anybody that they're interested in sharing this information with, I do have a, um, a general easy lower extremity exercise program um, that I designed that's just, you know, for people that just need to get started with some um, leg exercise um, because they're not sure how to lift weights, they don't want to go to a gym or anything, it gets them started with some body weight resistant exercise. So I have that available if you're interested, you can just let me know.